Parish Unitarian Universalists of Arlington, Massachusetts. This service on Zoom technology is open to the public and strives to strike the balance between welcoming and respectful of private boundaries while sharing time in each other's homes. We are using computer technology and that can feel complicated. So for the next few minutes before we settle into worship, we'd like to go over the technical parts so you can then settle in and enjoy the service once the prelude starts. If you're already comfortable with these, the next few minutes is a great time to find your candle and something to light it with for later in the service. If you lose the connection, our Zoom link is in the yellow banner at the top of our website, firstparish.info. The host has put everyone on mute except our speakers. We unmute everyone for our breakout rooms to return to worship mode when you return from the breakouts. Please help us by clicking on the microphone in the lower left to make the red bar appear. on your phone to mute and unmute dial star six. If your connection or sound is poor, try turning off your video in the lower left of your screen. This reduces the bandwidth that you are using. When you look at your screen, you can choose to see just the speaker or you can view everyone in the gallery. Here we point to the button that changes between the two. It's located on the top right of your screen. In person during our services, we would use baskets to collect donations for the works of First Parish, which we share each week with our chosen Giving First recipient. And now we have buttons to click and that makes things feel more complicated and secular. I would like to explain the mechanics now so when the prelude begins, we can hold a more spiritual space and you can more fully enjoy our worship service. We have three ways to donate. You can give online, by text message, or with a check. Of course, you're welcome to donate at any time, but let's talk about how. If you wanna give online, please visit firstparish.info slash give. Click the bright orange button that says give online and then fill out the form. In the form, offer the amount you would like and under fund, please choose plate the Sunday offering and finish filling in the form according to the instructions. To give via text, Please text the letters F-P-U-U -U to the number 73256. It will respond with a link for you to click. Complete the form from the link. Offer the amount you would like under Fund, please choose Plate, the Sunday offering. And finish filling in the form according to the instructions. At the bottom, click the button to give. Finally, you are always welcome to mail us a check. Please write it to FPUU of Arlington and address the envelope to 630 Mass Ave, Arlington, Mass 02476. We thank you for your generosity. Welcome. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalist of Arlington, Massachusetts, and to this virtual space of real community. I am Amy Anderson, your volunteer worship associate. I am joined by many wonderful volunteers who have given of their time and talent as musicians, as techies, and as creative problem solvers to shape today's worship. Our lead minister, Reverend Marta Flanagan, and our new associate minister, Reverend Erica Richmond, will return to our virtual pulpit in September. 
Today, we welcome First Parish member Mary Breen as our lay worship leader. Whether you are Zooming from another time zone or from a block away from our historic First Parish building, we welcome you. Whether you came hoping for spiritual guidance or solace or for a hymn you can belt out from behind the comfort of a mute button, we welcome you. Whether or not you know what you are looking for as you join worship this morning, you are welcome here. We welcome visitors especially. If you would like to get to know more about our First Parish community, send an email to our membership committee at membership at firstparish.info. We look forward to meeting you and answering any questions you may have about First Parish UU. In the last week, COVID infections rose rapidly in many states through the country. Yesterday, protesters marked the two-month anniversary of the death of George Floyd, whose murder at the hands of police sparked protests that spread around the world and continue on a daily basis. This morning, perhaps as I speak, the body of Congressman John Lewis will be carried, accompanied by an honor guard, across that famous bridge in Selma, Alabama, where state troopers in 1965 fractured his skull as he marched peacefully with 600 others in protest of police violence and in support of voting rights. We light this chalice remembering Congressman Lewis's unflagging commitment to the ideals of justice and freedom and to the service and to service of the common good. In his words, freedom is not a state, it is not an act, it is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we all must make, and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, more just society. May we continue his good work. May this flame light us the way forward. Please join me in our congregational affirmation. We choose to be a liberal religious community, welcoming to all. We encourage each other on our spiritual journeys, support one another through the challenges and changes in our lives, and challenge the excesses and injustices of our time called to love and upheld by joy, we live our faith. I now welcome Mary Breen and Molly Breen Aronson, who will lead us in our time for all ages. Good morning. I'm Mary Breen. And I'm Molly Breen Aronson. And these are our friends, Piggy and Dog. Good morning. Good morning. So Piggy and Dog, one of my favorite things in the whole world is music. I love listening to music and I love playing music. So this morning, I'd like to play some music for you on my viola. Great. Yay. We can't wait. This piece is by a composer called Bach. He lived a long time ago and likes to write pieces with lots of notes. Lots of notes, okay. What do you think she means by lots of notes? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think she's playing? Okay, go. <laughs> No, 
no, no, no. Oh, oh. Hey guys. Oh. Um, what did you hear? Uh, some notes. Um. Uh. Uh. Yeah, some notes. Okay. How did the music make you feel? Uh. Nothing. Oh. Sorry. We weren't really paying attention. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Let's try again. Do you know what it means to listen with your whole heart? Listen with your whole heart? No, what does that mean? All right, so you're going to close your eyes, take a deep breath, and get really quiet inside. Then, listen. <laughs> Did you learn anything? Yeah, I learned that if you listen with your whole heart, you can hear a lot more. Yeah, if you listen with your whole heart, you can hear beauty. Thank you, Molly. Thanks, guys. <laughs> and now we'll go back to Amy and have time to greet each other. Thank you so much, Mary and Molly and friends. It has become our custom during the pandemic to greet each other in breakout rooms. We miss handshakes and hugs, but sharing seven minutes together, listening with others has many rewards we did not anticipate. We offer you this prompt this week. What have you enjoyed listening to during the week? You'll have seven minutes. You'll receive a message at minute seven that you have 10 seconds left in your breakout group. So please I'm be mindful to this week. Please be mindful mm -hmm. of the time passing. Mm -hmm. Make sure everyone has a chance to share. Smile. No, no, now you look grotesque. Be brave, share deeply and listen well. I'm Al Tosti, one of the volunteer lay ministers at First Parish. Anytime worship brings us together, we each bring our deep sorrows and our great joys. Sharing what is in our hearts brings us together as a community. At this time, if you have a candle, I invite you to light it and place it where all can see the glow. As you can light it, think about one matter in your heart. For instance, you may light it in gratitude a grief, a celebration, or a hope. Each candle holds whatever bring, it brings matter you bring to it. While we each in our separate living spaces, we think in a unifying act, watching a sea of candles come to life on our prayers and uh, screens in prayer. After you have lit your candle, you are welcome to share your joy or concern in a chat box. We ask that you keep in mind that this is a public gathering and anyone in the Zoom meeting can see what you post. The chat list will be distributed among our lay ministers who will continue to hold your joys and concerns in their prayers and in the days ahead. We begin sharing the matters close in our hearts. Let us bring forward our cares and our prayers and let us keep them named as well as unnamed in our hearts this week. You may begin. Spirit of life, ancestor of the stars and the sun, you who embrace the vastness of space and us along with, uh, with it, be with us today. Hold us in our worry, our exhaustion, and our grief. Keep us close as we sit with our truth, whatever that may be. Lead us to rest in the quiet, to find solace and renewal. You whose arms open with the spinning galaxies, help us make room for all that is. Open our hearts to our loved ones, our neighbors, the beings with whom we share this planet. Lead us to reach out to others in compassion. Turn us towards one another in mercy, 
right relationship and reconciliation. You who have seen the rising and setting of suns, of seasons, of civilizations, remind us of all that we have learned from the history of the world and from our own histories. Give us the courage to face our mistakes and to repair them whenever possible. Help us understand our interdependence, our relatedness with all the other spinning lives around us and lead us to treat those relationships with care. In this space, filled with the people among us who shine like stars, let this space be filled with the sparkle of love and care. We give thanks for this moment to be together. May our senses be open to the beauty of this day, this season, this world. We continue our contemplation in silence. Each week, half of our offering supports the life and work of First Parish. This week, we live our faith by sharing the other half of our offering with friends of Waltham Family School. Waltham Family School empowers English language learners to be literate, self-sufficient, and connected to the greater Waltham community. Friends of Waltham Family School raises awareness and financial support for the school as it carries out its mission to build up people, families, and community. Thank you for your generosity. Good morning. The philosopher and theologian Paul Tillich said, the first duty of love is to listen. Today, I'd like to explore the idea that listening can transform relationships, that deep listening requires courage, that when we transcend the fear of hearing and holding the pain of others, we have true connection, that we have the possibility for transformation in both our personal lives and in our work for social and racial justice, that deep listening can bring us to a place of love and moral clarity required to bring about lasting change. So, take a deep breath, close your eyes, and think of a time that was stressful for you. Not the worst experience, but a tough time. Maybe you'd worked hard and someone was critical of your efforts or didn't even notice. Maybe someone had said something that hurt you. Maybe you were left out. Maybe you were worried. You told someone and they said, Oh, he shouldn't feel that way. I'm sure they didn't mean it. Or, wow, that happened to a friend of mine, and you know what she did. Or, you should hear what I went through today. Oh, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Just calm down and let it go. Look on the bright side. You should be grateful. Okay, here's what you should do. What's it like to be responded to that way? Do you feel understood? How do you feel in your body? Your facial muscles, your belly? Do you feel loved? Now imagine that you told someone what happened and they said, wow, tell me about that. 
and then they were quiet. You could tell by the expression on their face that you had their full attention. Tell me more. What did that feel like for you? Is there anything else you wanted to say? What's it like to be responded to that way? Do you feel understood? Do you feel heard? How do you feel in your body? Your facial muscles? Your belly? Do you feel loved? As a psychologist, I've had the privilege of listening to people for over 25 years. I've listened in all kinds of settings to all kinds of people, all ages, and almost everyone has felt that someone important in their life is not listening. My kids don't listen, my spouse doesn't listen, my friends don't listen, my parents never listen, they don't even know me. I'm very sure that I don't always listen well, even when it matters to my dearest ones. Just ask my two teenagers and my husband. As a new therapist, I was often so focused on what I was supposed to say or do that I didn't listen very well. I remember feeling very frustrated during one of my first sessions with one of my first clients, a anxious woman who was not responding to my valiant efforts to teach her to feel calm by tensing and relaxing different muscle groups. It wasn't until I got quiet long enough to learn why shifting her attention to her body was frightening for her because of a past trauma. When I slowed down and listened, over time, I was able to hear about experiences she had not shared before, accompanied by tears of relief and burdens of self-blame lifted. This was far more healing than focusing on her anxiety and trying to teach her to relax. We spend so much time talking in our society and learning how to talk. You can find all manner of classes on public speaking, but not too many on how to listen. Someone might say, wow, that was a great speech, an awesome presentation, good job participating in class. But we don't often hear, wow, you listened really well. As a society, we don't seem to value listening much, and we don't get taught how to do it. Really listening requires a kind of attention and stillness used in contemplative practices, including worship, like meditation, like prayer, like being in nature and being still enough to experience awe. We are present and in connection with something larger than ourselves. When we pray in whatever form that might take, we probably expect that God or spirit is listening. And we probably don't expect that our prayer will be answered in the form of, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. I had an important lesson in listening here at First Parish when I was co-teaching fourth grade religious education with fellow member David Desjardins. The topic was the Hebrew Bible. I always had extra activities planned so that I could keep the kids entertained. I was sure they would be bored by those dusty Old Testament stories. But when it was David's turn to lead class, he slowly read the story of Cain and Abel. He asked the kids what they thought, and then he was quiet. Our kids talked about their own siblings or friendship rivalries, times when they felt a parent or teacher had been unfair, what it's like to feel really angry and jealous, what they might do about that. Wow, we would have missed all that rich conversation if I had filled that awkward silence with a Cain and Abel coloring page. So why don't we listen to each other more often and more deeply? What gets in the way? First of all, the world is so noisy. We're busy and our attention spans are shorter and shorter. We look at our phones instead of each other. We text instead of talk. We get news from sound bites and Twitter. Even so, when we do have time, most of us don't listen with the intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply or solve a problem. Sometimes conversation can feel like people are just waiting to talk. I know I found myself rehearsing my answers before the other person has even finished a thought. It takes deliberate effort to put aside our own needs and reactions, to tolerate a moment of silence, to stop thinking about what we'll say next or how we might be perceived. We also listen to our own experience and our own identities, including listening through inherent cultural bias that we might not be conscious of. If we're a parent, we might listen through ears of worry for our child. If we're a spouse, we might listen through ears of not wanting to be wrong. If we're a manager, we might listen through ears of just wanting to get the job done quickly. 
If we're white, we might listen to a person of color with suspicion or with guilt. I've come to believe much of the time we don't listen because we're afraid. Why are we so quick to try to fix the problem and tell someone not to worry? This requires surrendering to our own vulnerability. When we don't want to feel pain, we quickly dismiss the pain of others. You shouldn't feel that way. I'm sure they didn't mean it. Look at the bright side. When we don't want to feel helpless, we feel compelled to offer a quick solution before we really understand what the other person is up against. It's uncomfortable to let yourself experience someone else's pain. It hurts. It can make you wince. We don't always want to sign up for that. But when we try too quickly to get to the fix or even to the hope, we can often make the pain worse because we leave the person confused and alone with it. In the same way that opening ourselves to the discomfort and pain of others in our lives can help us connect, might we find better solutions to injustice if we could stop talking and listen? It is from this place of internal stillness that we might really listen to each other across diverse backgrounds. I remember with humility a time when I attended a bystander training workshop offered by the wonderful improv group, True Story Theater. I was in a group of three women, two black and me, a white woman. We were asked to share a story of racism either experienced or witnessed. One of the women spoke of being hired to work at a respected government agency, only to be told on her first day of the job that she should realize she was a token hire to fill a diversity quota. It had been many years ago, but the hurt was still on her face as she spoke. I was all outraged on her behalf and strongly encouraged her to let her story be the one that the actors would dramatize for the whole group. I didn't sit quietly with her story or ask what it was like for her. I didn't ask what a bystander could have sent or done to support her in that moment. My agenda was not really to understand, but to be seen as an outspoken and supportive white person, one of the good ones. My internalized white privilege allowed me to tell her to share her story. Oh, we should definitely use yours. I didn't think about whether she wanted to share with the whole group or to use her pain as a training experience. I think back, I wince hard and wonder, did she feel heard, understood? How did she feel in her body? Did she feel love? Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times in May entitled, Let Our People Go. She wrote that in the Marion Correctional Institute in Ohio, that 80% of the prisoners have been infected with coronavirus, 80%. Despite desperate pleas from activists, family members, <clears throat> and medical experts, inmates who were elderly, sick, Committed, committed minor offenses or nearing the end of their sentence were not being released. Why is no one in power listening? In that column, Michelle Alexander shared a letter written by an inmate. The letter has haunted me. It describes truly harrowing conditions for inmates with COVID-19. Gravely sick individuals <clears throat> who receive only the most critical care. The writer describes crowding, shortages of medication and PPE, and inmates nursing a friend back to health by boiling Vicks 45 and allowing him to inhale the steam. I include only a brief sampling of the letter here. He writes, along my way to the day room, I met a nurse who just finished passing out daily medications. I asked her if we'd be retested for the virus. After testing positive with 2000 other men and with the symptoms seeming to linger and even recur, I'm eager to be retested. It's been 14 days since the test. We should be negative by now. I'm concerned that we're reinfecting each other. The middle-aged nurse with the sweetest demeanor gave me her undivided attention and began to speak comfortingly to me. This is a rarity in prison. Nurses are usually curt and distracted, so I tuned in. <clears throat> she assured me that we would be retested at some point. I should be patient. The nursing staff really cares about us. I shouldn't listen to what was being said in the hallways. They're taking good care of us. Everyone who needs serious medical attention is being sent out. The proof of their commitment to us is the fact that they're here. They could have quit like other nurses. I should look at the bright side. 
Even with all the cases, only a few had to be sent to outside hospitals. She continued to explain why we should be grateful that we're receiving any care at all. She encouraged me to tell the men around me to be grateful. I wondered how grateful she would be with no toothpaste or soap. The conversation saddened me because the nurse meant well. She was sincere. She was one of the good ones. She reminded me of one of the moderates Dr. King talked about with, from his letter from a Birmingham jail. If the good people feel this way, then we are really in trouble. Despite all her passion, her main agenda was not to hear my needs or my concerns or help address them. She was all right if my problems didn't go away as long as I didn't make too much of a fuss about it. We don't have to wonder how that man felt after that conversation. He didn't feel heard or understood. He didn't feel settled in his body. He didn't feel love. Alexander writes, after reading this letter, I took a deep breath. I had to admit to myself that there was a time when I was that nurse. I was well-intentioned, sincere person who viewed myself as working for social justice, yet unconsciously believed that the lives of some people matter a bit less. I too have been that nurse. If we deeply listen to experiences of racism, it is painful. But we need to put aside our discomfort and fear. We need to listen with the kind of presence that will help us see and accept what is happening and experience the moral imperative to take responsibility. In this way, listening becomes a moral responsibility. In our own lives, when a child or a spouse or a parent or a friend tells you you're not listening, that might be a gift. They're coming to you with their troubles, they're asking for connection, they're asking for love. Take time to listen. In our racial justice work, those of us who are white listening to the reality, are those of us who are white listening to the reality of the lives of people of color? Or are we quick to feel defensive or overwhelmed and tune out? Are we quick to ask, what should I do? Instead of committing to a lifelong process of critical listening to injustice and following the lead of people of color. The next time someone asks for your attention, you might pause and check in with yourself. Are you thinking about how to fix the problem or make it go away quickly? You might take time to take a deep breath, relax your shoulders, and focus on understanding rather than responding. Instead of what can I say, how could I listen? When we're working towards racial justice, it's important for all of us to check in with ourselves. Am I feeling defensive, fearful? Do I think I have the answers? Am I listening deeply enough to hear others' true pain and experience my sense of moral responsibility to recognize the humanity, worth, and dignity of every person? I started with a quote from Paul Tillich, the first duty of love is to listen. That line is from a longer passage about justice. In order to know what is just in a person-to-person -person encounter, love listens. All things and all men call on us with small or loud voices. They want us to listen. They want us to understand their inherent claims, their justice of being. They want justice from us, but we can give it to them only through love which listens. I'll end with a contemporary writer, Glennon Doyle, who says, deep listening is the superpower that makes you wiser and more connected. When we can slow down, get quiet and listen deeply, when we listen to understand rather than react, it allows people to bring their full selves to us, knowing that they will be heard, understood, and held in love.
and join me now in our benediction. If you are with someone, you may take their hand. And if not, I invite you to cross your arms in an embrace, a physical reminder of the world holding you still. May faith in the spirit of life. May faith in the spirit of life. Hope for the community of earth. Hope for the community of earth. And love of the sacred in one another. And love of the sacred in one another. The hours now and in all the days to come. The hours now and in all the days to come. Thanks.